Hello, everybody. We'll begin in about four minutes. Four minutes until we start. Four, well, now three minutes until we start. I'll start writing up some things here. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, good morning, everybody. Okay. All right, all right. Um, so we have a lot of good questions uh, on this that you guys uh, related. So let me just take a gander of some of these, as there's a ton of them. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, there's a lot of good questions on, on this sheet that I, I got from uh, basically from my staff. I got them from you guys. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Alex Gratuin. I'm the director of uh, Advanced Lung and Heart Disease. Um, I'll be going over uh, first. So first lip breathing, pulmonary function test, weight control, staying motivated, and CO2 levels. Okay, as I see on here. Uh, I see, there, well, there's a ton of questions on here. So I'll try to get through all of these as, <laughs> as fast as I can, <laughs> in a sense, that... Uh, one question is, how to compare the results of my recent lung function test? Okay, so first off, a pulmonary function test is, it's a, it's a device uh, that it's either a body box, which is the full test, uh, or a diagnostic test that's the handheld there. Uh, I believe it's from ResMed, Easy One is what they call them. Small little handheld device with a little spirette that goes inside of it and basically you breathe in and out uh, according to the instructions the device is giving a, or as well as the respiratory therapist that's giving the pulmonary function test. Uh, basically what we look at on pulmonary functions, we look at FEV, FEC, but there's a lot of other things that we look at too. So I don't wanna take that away from it. So let me kind of bring up an easy way to understand that really quick. And let me just go through I just want to use uh, the correct data on here. So, okay. So on a pulmonary function test, I don't know if you can kind of see here. Do you see that where it says it's the PFT and it says lung volumes and capacities? So total lung capacity, the TLC, is not tender love and care. It's uh, total lung capacity. So that's how much, basically, how functional your, uh, well, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. That's, that's basically the total volume. 
of your lungs, total volume. And how do we measure our total volume? How do we measure our total volume? So you can measure with an incentive spirometer as that's a, uh, the maneuver is called an SMI, sustained maximum inspiratory. So when we measure on an incentive spirometer, that's not gonna be a pulmonary function test, but it'll give us an idea of exactly how deep we can breathe in, you know, how, how much air can go into our lungs, basically. So what we really look at here is not necessarily the total lung capacity, but when you go through a body box, that's basically what they're going to find out is what is your total lung capacity. But what is your uh, uh, VC or forced vital capacity? VC or FVC stands for forced vital capacity. <sighs> How much air you can exhale forcefully. <laughs> okay. Then you have the IC, which is the inspiratory capacity, and you have the FRC, forced residual capacity. And then you have the IRV, which is the inspiratory reserve volume. Uh, VT is tidal volume. That's how much air we normally breathe in and out any given time. And then the ERV, which is the expiratory reserve volume. The only things we can't measure with an incentive spirometer is the actual RV, okay, residual volume. See, when you exhale, your lungs don't actually clench all the way because there's going to be residual volume. And if that wasn't happening, then basically your lungs will start sticking together because you always want to have some air in there. So uh, residual volume, uh, we measure it with nitrogen washout uh, when you go through a pulmonary function test. But anyways, that sounds like a lot of jargon and everything like that. Let's make it really simple to understand, yeah? So to really understand this, let me cross this. Now, let's look at this a little more easier, just so we can understand a pulmonary function test. The doctor's office wasn't too clean either. <laughs> I'm sorry, that sucks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they sh um, it should be a very clean test, <laughs> you know, where uh, they should be, you know, uh, anyways, anyways, anyways. Uh, so on a pulmonary function test, we're going to look at PFTs, okay? So let's look at the lungs really quick. Now there's some baseline measurements that we have to... <laughs> Lori, you're cracking me up. So <laughs> let's look at some of the baseline values that we have to understand. First, we have to understand how tall you are. So, and then we have to look at your ideal body weight. Okay, your ideal body weight, which is based off of your height. So the measurement calculation, which I always bring up in my classes, is 65 milliliters per kilogram of your ideal body weight. Okay, so like for instance, I'm six foot tall, which is true. So I'm six foot tall according to, uh, to you know, a, a, a ideal body weight calculator, I'm supposed to be at 82 kilograms or 180 pounds. So if I'm supposed to be at 82 kilograms, and how do I know it's 82 kilograms? Because 180 divided by 2.2 is 81.8, just round up and say 82. So I'm 82 kilograms ideal body weight or equivalent to 180 pounds, just converted. So 180 pounds or 82 kilograms multiplied by 65, okay? Multiply, I shouldn't put it in parentheses, uh, but multiply by 65, and that's going to give me 5,330. Okay, so if I took 82 multiplied by 65, I should take those parentheses out, I'm just trying to show and tell which one's which. So where did I get the 65 from? It's always 65. 65 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So I took my ideal body weight, put it into kilograms, because that's how the calculation works, and that mine is 82 kilograms, because I'm 180 pounds. Divide that by 2.2, and that gives me 81.8. Round up and say 82. So 82 kilograms of my ideal body weight multiplied by 65 
it's going to give me 5,330 milliliters. That is my total lung volume. That's how much air can literally go into my lungs. Okay, so if I took an incentive spirometer, <clears throat> so the max I can go on this incentive spirometer is 4,000. So needless to say, if, I'm, if I want to maximize my lung volumes, I want to understand how much can go into my lungs, but this one only goes up to 4,000, when my max is 5,330, what I need to do is bring up the piston all the way up to the 4,000, probably leave it up there for about a second or two, okay? So let's see how, how, how high am I on my volumes. So I breathe all the way out first. Mind you, if you have a delta V, you always set it to a zero when you're measuring, all right? So, so I exhale first all the way out. I can tell there's no air left in my lungs. So I can keep this up there for about a second or two. So roughly mine is about maxed, maxed out at 5,330, okay? Roughly, probably a little higher than that, but because my incentive spiral doesn't go up to 4,000, uh, it only goes up to 4,000 and not 6,000, I can't, I can only measure it up to 4,000, right? Okay, now, once I fill up my lungs all the way, okay, once I fill up my lungs all the way, I can do a rough guess pulmonary function test on myself at home, okay? So what I would have to have is a timer. So the rule of thumb is you're forced vital capacity. So remember, you need to fill up your lungs all the way. Filling it up 100%. And then you need to exhale all that out in one second. Okay. If you can only exhale, let's say, let's say you can only exhale 10% of that. Let's say I can, well, let's make the math really easy. Let's say I exhaled and it lasted, let me draw it up like this. Okay, first off, what number would it have to be, what would my FEV, FEC have to be in order for me to have COPD? And no, it is not the FVEV by itself. It's FEV slash FEC. So it's FEV in one second by the forced vital capacity, okay? A lot of people get that confused because they're like, well, my FEV is like 10%, 15%, 20%. I say, but what's your FEV with your forced vital capacity? What's your FEV one with your forced vital capacity? And let's say that is 70%, then technically that person has COPD. Okay, but very mild. Okay, what, so what is the number that would determine if I have COPD or not? And how can I do this test at home? So that's what we're going to do right now. <clears throat> so let's look at some of these numbers here. Okay. So let me draw, write it up in a different color ink. All right. Okay. All right. So anything from 80 to 120 percent uh, would be considered normal. Anything less than, anything going out, like once it's 79, then technically I have very mild COPD, like very, very mild COPD, okay? So if I'm at 79 percent, which is just one less than 80 percent, 
then technically I have COPD, but it's very, 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 very mild. Basically, you wouldn't really notice a big difference in yourself at all with 79%. Um, and to get that back up is super easy anyways. But anyways, um, so this is on a percentage. Now, let's look at this as a timer in a sense. Let's look at this as a time. If I exhaled all the volume out through my lungs, okay, so I filled up my lungs all the way and I exhaled in one second, okay, in one second, that's 120%. If it took me, let's say I filled up my lungs all the way, and I'll show you this really quick, so don't, don't worry. If I exhaled, you know, I fill up my lungs all the way. All right, let me move that to the side. If I fill up my lungs all the way and I exhale, how fast did I get rid of all the air out of my lungs? So if I exhaled, and let's say it lasted for three seconds. Let's say it lasted for four seconds. Let's say it lasted for five seconds, meaning it took me five seconds to exhale all that volume out then I'm at 80%, okay? This is one second, two seconds, three, four, five. Okay? So this is one second, two, three, four, five. Now mind you, this is, I'm just showing you, according to the question, I'm just showing you and a kind of rough ball, like a rough guess, but a pretty good guess <laughs> uh, with a with an incentive spirometer. You have to understand a pulmonary function test is just a big, huge incentive spirometer in a sense that calculates all sorts of stuff. Okay, so an incentive spirometer can be used as a pulmonary function test guide. All right, in a sense, in a way. So basically, if I fill up my lungs all the way. I click on a timer, you know, I start a timer and see how long did it take for me to exhale all that out as fast as humanly possible. And whatever seconds you're at. So if it's six seconds, if it's six seconds, then you're probably at 75% FAG1 slash FEC. If it only took you three seconds to exhale, then you're at 100%, you're considered normal. If it took you four seconds, then you're still considered normal. You know, it's at 90%. If, it, if you exhale, so you breathe all the way in. You look at your measurement. You exhale all that out. And remember, as soon as you start exhaling, that's when you start the timer. And as soon as you exhale all the way out as fast as you can, stop the timer once you can't get rid of any more air. Okay. And that will give you a rough guess of what your pulmonary function score would be if you did a pulmonary function test. So I saw on here, if you're scared of using a pulmonary function test, you can do one yourself and see how well you are, like where you're at. And don't be scared of the results. You know, these results are just there so you can understand where you're at with your lung functions. That's it. Okay, what about using a Bluetooth connected spirometer for home use? I think that's great if you, uh, if you have a... Uh, a Bluetooth connect this spirometer, that's perfect. You know, just make sure that any device you use has been, been FDA cleared. Okay, meaning it's been through the FDA as a diagnostic device. If it's not FDA cleared, like there are incentive spirometers that are definitely not incentive uh, that are stated that they're incentive spirometers, but they never got passed through the FDA, then they're not going to be considered accurate because there's no peer review. You always want peer review with anything that's coming out. So like, so let's say you have a, a pulse oximeter and let's say even, let's, you have two pulse oximeters, one that it was not FDA cleared and the other one that was cleared. So the one that even though they were pretty like uh, if it's a good pulse oximeter, they probably might be identically accurate. But the thing is, you can't rely on the one that's not FDA approved. You can rely on the one that's FDA proof because it was peer reviewed. Peer review means you have other clinicians, other people in that specialty looking at the data, seeing that it's reproducible, meaning one person used it, another person used it, another person, and they gave pretty much the same accurate 
um, um, amounts, uh, percentages of oxygen saturations, you know. But that, I'm just talking about pulse oximeter. So what I'm really talking about is the FDA. So you just want to make sure that they're FDA cleared. So if they are FDA cleared, then yes, then it's a good device. If it is not FDA cleared, then you might want to search for one that is FDA cleared. And you can easily see them like on an, uh, a pulse oximeter. Let me grab a pulse ox here. Okay. So on this pulse ox, I'm not sure if you can see that. No, it's just blur it's just blurry. But on the top it says contact pulse oximeter model CMS 50D. So CMS Center for Medicaid. So that's the FDA. Okay. So that is FDA. So this pulse oximeter is FDA approved. All right. Then you have another, which I, I don't think I have any pulse oximeters that are not FDA approved. But let's say you don't have a, um, you know, let's just say you, you, you have a device and you want to know if it's a good device. Just check to see if it's FDA approved. That's all. OK, so now once I put a pulse ox on, everyone should know that a pulse ox doesn't measure oxygen. Actually, it assumes there's oxygen. OK, so if I put a pulse oximeter. First off, once I put a pulse oximeter, I know we're talking about pulse oximeter when I was talking about pointing function tests, but I just want to just clarify something. Once I put a pulse oximeter on to my finger, how long do I wait for? 30 seconds. As soon as you put it on, you turn it on, no matter, once the first number shows up, so right now there's not a number showing up, even though it's been on there for a while. Now, since the first number showed up, I have to wait 30 seconds from that time, okay? So once 30 seconds has been alleviated, has been, you know, diminished, and then I count whatever's left over at 30 seconds. As you can see, now it's at 98% with a heart rate at 88%. If I looked at the first, very good, Lori, if I looked at the first number, it could have scared me, right? Because I was all 91% or somebody saw 30% and you would be dead if that was true. So you always wait that 30 seconds. And why do you wait 30 seconds? Because this is a spring. Okay, it pushes the blood out a little bit, just on any skin surface, push pressure on any skin. You see a little, the capillary blood just got moved out. And as soon as you take the pressure off, it turns back to, uh, back to color, you know, back to a good color again. Uh, in, in my case, um, olive. <laughs> That's my complexion, is olive complexion. All right, but a pulse ox has never measured oxygen for those who do not know. Because if it has measured oxygen, then I can turn it on and wave it in the air like I just don't care. I use that a lot. Um, and it would measure the oxygen in the room, but it's not doing that. It just shuts right back off because it doesn't measure oxygen. It measures hemoglobin and assumes how much oxygen is attached to that red blood cell that's attached to the hemoglobin. A red blood cell, for those that don't know, so you have a red blood cell, these are hemoglobins. Currently, there is the, uh, the SpO2 on this, the saturated percentage of oxygen, would equal zero because there's no oxygen binding on it. As soon as I put some oxygen, onto the red blood cell, that would be 100% saturated. Oops, I forgot one. Okay, 100% saturated. If I took half of them away, then that's obviously 50% saturated. Okay, so your body is supposed to be consuming oxygen at all times or else it starts to die. Um, now think about that. If your body is consuming oxygen at all times, and you're left over with 100%, meaning this was all filled up with oxygen, that means the body never depleted anything. Because 100% means, let's just pretend that, even though it's 100% true, uh, let's say oxygen comes in, let's just pretend it's 100% saturated, okay? 
as it goes to the heart, how much did the heart consume? 20% right there. So that now it's down to 80%, right? Brain consumes 30%. That's 50% right there. The brain and heart just consume 50%. So if I took one breath, how long would that breath, breath last in that body? About six to eight seconds. So needless to say, to keep my oxygen sats high, I have to continuously breathe. If I breathe very slowly, I'm preventing oxygen from coming in as well as it should, uh, depending on how I feel. Meaning like if I'm exercising, I should be breathing faster, uh, increasing my heart rate and allowing more oxygen sets uh, to be, you know, to be utilized and used. So my point, of course, is on a saturated oxygen with an, a pulse oximeter, if this is all, let's say you measure with your pulse ox, it's measuring at the extremity, which is the very end. So the extremities are hands, feet, okay? Those are extremities, okay? And parts of your, parts of your uh, you know, head too. So anyways, so your extremities. Imagine this, all the oxygen got depleted by the body. So just because oxygen is in the blood doesn't mean the tissues are pulling the oxygen out from the blood and consuming it, okay? So it should be doing that, but let's just say let's just say you're left over. You saw 100% saturated oxygen. That means how much did the brain consume? Nothing. How much did the heart consume? Zero. How much did everything else consume? So depending on how pure the oxygen is coming in, it could actually increase our oxygen but slow our heart rate down because that's how the body doesn't like to breathe pure oxygen. First off, it never likes pure oxygen. And what will happen as, you know, as, as like in my profession, what will happen is if you put in too much pure oxygen, the body will try to reject it. And how it rejects it is it slows the heart rate down. The reason why it slows the heart rate down is because it doesn't want to bring in pure oxygen with an FiO2 of 100% throughout the body because now the heart's going to start slowing down because it's trying to stop that much oxygen from coming in. So if you slow your heart rate down, what would your oxygen look like? It might look like 100%, right? So, but the heart's slowing down now. So the heart's slowing down more and more and more. Now, you're looking at oxygen. What people don't realize is look at the CO2. What's going to happen with the CO2 when the heart slows down? It's going to start to increase. It's going to start going up. Because even though you're breathing fast, <laughs> it's the travel of blood with the CO2 in it is not traveling fast enough to the lungs so you can breathe it out. Okay. Because just because, like, if I took an end tidal CO2 monitor, meaning checking how much CO2 is coming out from my body, and by the way, those are super expensive. I mean, I the small little device that I have is two thousand dollars, just this small little thing, and you put it on your mouth and you see how much. It's uh, used for tracheostomies, but uh, it just shows how much CO2 is coming out. If I put an end tidal CO2 monitor, it's called a Katnacek. It's a Oops. I'm not telling you to, to get anything like this because it's just ridiculously expensive. Hospitals and clinicians, you know, uh, in general, buy these types of devices for their practice. Anyways, so it's a ETCO2, okay, end tidal CO2 monitor check. So anyways, if I put an end tidal CO2 monitor, okay, the normal CO2 that should be coming out, the normal CO2 that should be coming out should be a good amount, right? It should be around 32, 35, maybe sometimes 24 if you're exercising. But basically, if I breathe fast, I'm going to look at my CO2. Let's say it was 44. It's going to start going down and down and down and down as I'm breathing really fast. It's called hyperventilating, okay? I'm breathing out too much CO2. And in that case, my pH will start to go up which it doesn't like that, and I'm going to start feeling like I'm going to pass out, all right? So air coming into your to your body, remember, oxygen coming in from the atmosphere only comes in around 4 to 6%. So if you breathe in, 4 to 6% of the ambient air, the oxygen, okay, actually makes it to the blood, not 100%. So 4 to 6% only, okay? So if you ever get on Jeopardy, you'll get that, that question right if they were asked. 
how much oxygen from the atmosphere makes it to the blood every time you breathe. It's four to six percent. So four to six percent comes in, okay, and that is 100 percent saturated at first, let's say, okay. The body is constantly pulling that oxygen out, and you're left with, let's say, 88 percent. 90%. That means the body pulled a fair share of oxygen out during whatever, exercise, rest, whatever the case may be. Okay? But let's say somebody didn't understand and didn't realize that oxygen should always be pulled out of the blood. Oxygen should always be pulled out of the blood. Just because oxygen is in your blood doesn't mean your body's consuming it. Just because it's inside the body, inside the blood, doesn't mean it's being consumed. Okay? If you went into the emergency room and you were sitting at 100%, I'm usually going to think something's wrong, all right? Because your body should not be sitting at 100%. At rest, sure, why not? Okay, still considered normal. But at exercise, 100%, I'm thinking something's wrong, okay? I'll be thinking a lot of different things about that, but yes. Uh, what do you do, uh, what do you have to do to get rid of, get off the oxygen? So let's look at this further because we're talking about pulmonary function tests, and then I was going over NTO CO2 and uh, some of the other things. So look, if you took what I said and actually wrote some of the notes down, you would have a clear understanding because the answer is actually what I just said, really. I mean, if you really look at it. So let's look at it like this. Here's your lungs. Okay, I'll bring up the camera a little closer and mind the artwork. I'm not the greatest artist in the world on this, so just mind the artwork. Okay, as one lung is lower than the other. Like that. Okay, anyways, so if I breathe in shallow and that's 500 milliliters, okay, that means I breathe in 500 milliliters and up here would be zero, okay. If I breathe in 500 milliliters of air, so uh, um, Joe, the DLCO is um, basically it's a, it's, it's a diffusion uh, measurement. So when we measure a DLCO, we do a nitrogen washout uh, through a pulmonary function test. And we'll introduce nitrogen, which is very heavy, and we'll put it in through your system, into your lungs to wash out the residual and bring it up so that can be measured. You don't notice that as much because it's an inner, inner gas. Inner is spelt, it's an inner gas, okay? So, uh, so nitrogen, as that comes in, as nitrogen co uh, comes in, it's very heavy, so it will actually push out the, um, the residual volume. Remember what I said before? There's residual volume in your lungs. Remember I was bringing up that chart right here. Okay, it's a dry erase marker, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I just want to make sure I didn't write in a book with a permanent marker. Uh, residual volume. So to measure those, because we want to know the total lung capacity, we have to measure these. In order to measure these, we have to do nitrogen washout, which will give us the DLCO, okay, which is diffusion. All right, so. People that have a problem with diffusion is usually people that, let's say I took a small segment out, put it under a microscope, and now I see the alveolar sac, okay? The problem with the, uh, I don't want to say problem, but um, like let's say we take IPF, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The alveolar capillary membranes are just a lot thicker. And because they're thicker, remember, if air comes in, it's supposed to be transported to the capillary uh, capillary beds that's surrounding the alveoli. Okay, so what happens is 
Let's take a look a little bit more closer into here. Let me actually draw that up in a different color here. Let me do it like this. Okay, so this is blood. All right, inside here, so this is blood right in here. Okay, this is inside one alveoli. Inside the alveoli, you have micro, uh, um, phagocytosis cells. They're, um, they're white blood cells that stay dormant, that squirts out, secretes trypsin, okay? Then you have the alpha ones that are down below that neutralizes the acid secreted by the, uh, by the white blood cell. If you ever look up emphysema, you, you'll get a pretty good understanding. Anyways, as air comes in, it has to be transported past this barrier, okay? A thin barrier would make oxygen transportation to the blood easy. But a thicker barrier, like IP, idiopathic pony fibrosis, would make transportation of the oxygen through that thick membrane a lot tougher. So usually find people with IPF, idiopathic pony fibrosis, usually on high levels of oxygen, like 60, like 60 liters per minute, 24 liters per minute, sometimes 12 down. You know, if it's just starting, it wouldn't be very light. So how do we fix the thick membrane? Now, mind you, I'm not talking about a cure. I'm not talking about a cure. I want to make sure we understand. We're not, I'm not talking about a cure. What I'm talking about is how to fix it. So I know it sounds similar to each other, but it, it's not, okay? Because I'm not curing anything. What, what are we doing with this? You want to know how to get your idiopathic pony fibrosis, which is usually a terminal problem, okay? Fibro fibrosis, pony fibrosis, it's usually pretty terminal. So how do I get somebody that's supposed to be terminal back to square one, back to living again, okay? How do I get that person back? If you take a thick membrane, if you have thick membranes, there's a, I'm trying to see a therapy band here. Oh, here we are. If you have a thick membrane and you stretch out that membrane, what does it do? It thins it out. Okay. So how do we do that? Hyperinflation therapy. What is hyperinflation therapy? Hyperinflation therapy is usually done with a delta V. So I have a delta V, this device, okay. I set it to a pretty decent setting. First I start with a low setting. Let's say I start with a three or a four. I work my way up to about five or a six to possibly even a seven. So I breathe in, exhale through the device. It's gonna be tough to breathe out through high resistance. So let's say I have it up to a five. Now, mind you, I'm doing this six times a 10 minutes each. Once a four feels a lot easier to do, like I can breathe in and out a lot quicker, I'm going to move the weight setting higher. So from a four to a five, I'm going to repeat that process. Once I get used to that after about a week or two, and it feels like that weight, my, you know, the, the, my ribs are going to get really sore because now you're strengthening them up quite a bit. Once I get used to that and those weight setting isn't so bad anymore, meaning that these muscles are getting a lot stronger, I'm going to increase the weight a little bit more. So I go up to a six, do the same process all over again. The timing for it is inhale time is about four to five to six seconds. So when you inhale, you got to make it your inhale last for about six seconds until you fill up your lungs 100% and keep trying to bring in air. Okay, those muscles are getting really, really strong at that point. Now, as you're increasing that strength, you're going to feel a lot different, meaning food will be tasting a little different, um, a more acute, like you're more sensitive with the food for some reason like taste. Um, coming off oxygen is a lot easier. So somebody asked, what do you have to do to get off oxygen? So depending on your disease, like if you have IPF, 
you need to do hyperinflation therapy to thin out those membranes. Because if you stretch them out, you're physically, you know, thinning them out. So if you thin out those membranes, and somebody that is on, let's say, uh, let's say seven liters per minute with their uh, simple mask, not a nasal cannula, uh, with a simple mask, they're wearing seven liters per minute, and they start increasing or rather I should say they start, uh, they start decreasing the um, the membranes, thinning them out. That First they were thick, and now you stretch them, and now they're thin. Kind of look at it like a brand-new balloon, right? A brand-new balloon. You take a brand-new balloon, You uh, if you blow it up, it's very tough. But if you stretch it out first, then blow it up, it's a lot easier because you gain a lot of compliance now. You're, you're building up compliance. So once you thin out those membranes, transportation of that gas is a lot easier. Now that person can start coming down like down to six, down to, down to five, four, three, two, one, and then back to room air. So now that person, once we do that, that person will now be on room air when before they were on seven plus liters per minute. Okay, so thinning out those membranes is a tough task, but you wanna go with, um, you wanna go with professionals like me that specifically do that. So that's that's specifically what I do because I, I work with advanced lung and heart disease. You know, if you go with a, a regular respiratory therapist, no offense, but if they don't have any pulmonary rehab experience, they'll probably just know ventilators and things like that. Me, I know the ventilators, of course, but I also know pulmonary rehab because that's all I ever do. Pulmonary rehabilitation. I study and, and do research, do uh, testings, hypothesis on certain therapies and testing those hypotheses with different various things. So, yes, I do things in a scientific fashion, of course, because I want to see how this works on this person, this person, you know, how a technique work, works on each and an individual. So you're asking me how you can come off oxygen. I have to ask you, what, where is the problem? OK, don't tell me the problem is in your lungs. You have to be a little more specific. Right. Like Dana said, what about bronchiectasis? Well, what is bronchiectasis? What are our five types of COPDs? We have what? Emphysema, chronic bronchitis, not bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, asthma, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. OK, so what is bronchiectasis? So we understand it's bronchi related. ASIS, S-I-S, OK, is inflammation. OK, so like let's say I have um, bronchitis because there's an I-T-I-S in the last part. It's all based off of Greek. But anyways, because there's an I-T-I-S in it, um, that means it's inflammation of the what? Bronchi bronchitis. So inflammation of the bronchi. What is bronchiectasis? Ectasis is what? Does any, anybody want to give it a shot? Okay, so it's the production of a lot of what? Pus and other things that are coming out. So bronchiectasis, uh, let me take a look here. That's what bronchiectasis would look like. And cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis kind of look the same, actually. Okay, so you have those big, glob, big globs. Okay, uh, like if I was looking at emphysema, that's emphysema, where the top parts are usually always damaged. The bottoms are not as damaged as the ones on the top because the exposure is happening to the top of the lungs, not the bottom of the lungs when you breathe shallow. Okay. All right. So you want to know how to come off oxygen. So two things I need to know. First, I need to know what problem do you have first. Okay. If it's COPD, sure. Is it IPF? Is it what is it? Now, I just need to know what the problem is first. Second, I also need to know how deep can you breathe? Because if you're on a lot of oxygen, then I'm assuming the top part of your lungs are damaged. And if they're damaged, hold on one second, according to uh, ALK, I have read and heard from doctors and RT, COPD is not, it is not chronic bronchitis and or emphysema. Please explain. So according to ALK, I'm assuming you mean ALA, American Lung Association. I have read and heard from doctors and RT, COPD, it is not chronic bronchitis. Um, it is chronic bronchitis. That's what COPD is. It's cr you're chronically obstructed. So um, whoever told you that just 
And if it's three people, tell them to get the money back from the school they went to. Tell them I said that. Okay, a lot of people know me. <laughs> but uh, um, bron chronic bronchitis is COPD. Okay, where because it's a long term, right? It's chronic. It's long term. It's not acute bronchitis. What's well, short term? So short term bronchitis is not COPD. All right. Um, remember, there's five types of COPDs, but according, uh, uh, I would actually double check that, but chronic bronchitis is COPD, whether we like it or not. That's just what it is. You know, it's just based off of physics and how the physiology works in the body. If there's a lot of inflammation, air can come in, but it's going to have a hard time coming out. That's what COPD is, where you're chronically obstructed. You exhale, but you're not exhaling everything out. You know, that's what COPD is. In a nutshell, to, to, to explain somebody what COPD is, is you breathe in a gallon of air, you're only getting rid of half a gallon of air. That's really what it is. Okay. So how do you come off oxygen? So first off, if you're breathing at 500 milliliters, when the body needs, say it needs 2,000 milliliters of volume, okay, but you're only breathing at 500, so 500 milliliters, so you have a small amount of air. How much is 500 milliliters? Let's not use our incentive spirometer, so we'll use a chamber here. So if I fill this up with air, let's make it a little easier here. Here. Do -do 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 -do. Okay. So this is boost. I'm not sure. I just want to show you uh, the bottle has how many milliliters in it? 237 milliliters. 237. So to fill this up, the volume is 237. Uh, let's, just let's just double it. Okay, so two of these bottles of air is you, all you're bringing into this huge, massive body. How long would that last? And you bring in that in, 500 milliliters of air into your body, how much of that volume from the, like two of these, okay, you have two of these, which equals 500. How much percentage of that air I just breathed in is actually making it to the blood? Five, yeah, four to six percent. So would you rather bring in 4 to 6% of 500 or would you rather bring in 4 to 6% of 2,000? Okay, so why do you need so much oxygen? Because you're breathing too shallow. If you breathe in too shallow, the best you can do is sit still on oxygen. But as soon as you pick up your volume and increase that volume by 1,000 to even 1,500 milliliters, if you increase that volume, you're increasing that, you get more air coming in, more oxygen goes into the blood. And if you can keep that up with any, with, without any non-invasive ventilator, just, just you doing it yourself, which is all we do here. Um, but once you do that, then yes, you can come off oxygen. You just have to increase the surface area. The first thing you have to realize is that where's the damage in your lungs? Is it found on the side? Is it the top? Usually it's the top. But if it's found on the top, and these are all diseased, let's say these are all diseased, and I did a pulmonary function test, at, and my volume is at 500 milliliters, and my FEV1 slash FEC is equal to, let's say, 13%. Okay, 13%. So what is it talking about, the whole lung, or is it talking about what I can breathe in? Remember, the pulmonary function test is measuring what you can do. So it's measuring what's, what you can do. So let's say you can only breathe in at 500. When you did a math and you saw that you, your body, your lungs, your body was capable of doing 4,000 milliliters, if not maybe a little higher than that, 6,000 milliliters, what a human being should be at. But you're only breathing at 500 milliliters. Do you see where I'm getting at? There's not enough coming in, dropping your oxygen too low, too fast. Okay. What does it mean if I damage, uh, if damage is in the bottom lung, top is good? So usually that's not possible. If the so if you don't use the bottom part of your lungs because you can't breathe in very deep, then the bottoms get kind of, you know, they, they get very adventitious, you know, they, they get a little diseased, uh, diseased by not being utilized. 
meaning you're going to have a lot of atelectasis, a lot of crackles down there and bases, but you can't breathe in deep enough to expose the bottom parts to smoke, inhalation, pollution, household cleaners, dust, pollen, whatever, and what have you. Okay, because you can't do that, it's the top that's really damaged, while the bottom are still considered diseased because you're, you can't utilize them, you can't use them yet. All right, but as soon as you increase those muscles, the muscles in between the ribs, called intercostal muscles, once you increase that and the diaphragm, then you'll have enough muscle strength to open up the bottoms. You see the top part of the lungs, This is in milliliters and this is in pounds. The bottom parts of the lungs require 8 to 12 pounds of pressure to pull open the lungs that deep. Okay? To open up the top part of the lungs, it only takes 3 to 4 pounds of pressure to open up the top part of the lungs. Is that number measured by a, a spirometer? Yes, it is. I see. What does it mean if damage is in the bottom part? So remember that the, the bottom parts could not. They're not considered damaged. They're considered diseased because you can't use them, right? You can't use them yet. Uh, but as soon as you build up your volume, then you'll be able to utilize them, of course. So you have to build a volume. The only way to build a volume is hyperinflation therapy. A Delta V, you can go to, um, you can just call us and we'll just send you one. It's not a big deal. But I mean, we, we can't just send people them. You have to, uh, there is a cost to them. They're not freebies, of course. But our patients... What? Um, guys, hold on one second. Please don't uh, write in the comment sections. There's something going on here. Uh, Brianna. I need Brianna really quick. Where's Brianna? Did you see that? Okay. On YouTube, there's, yeah, it's somebody from YouTube. Okay. All right. Um, there is a, something on, uh, so we feed uh, our live feeds to YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and all others. Uh, but I noticed that this is girls18.xyz. So I apologize, but that's looks like somebody's, trying to advertise on the comment section. So don't respond to that at all. That's, uh, you're taking care of it. Thank you very much, Brianna. Okay, so I apologize. It's not on Facebook, it's on uh, YouTube. Um, we, we, we broadcast to YouTube too, but um, unfortunately YouTube doesn't, I don't wanna bash anybody down, but um, anyways, just don't, re just don't click on that YouTube thing. That's all, okay? Now I'm at comment section. Do you use, uh, but anyways, to get a Delta V, you just have to sign up for the program. But uh, if you just want to get a Delta V only, you just go to Delta V dot rehab. That's the website, www dot Delta V. It's delta v dot rehab. That's all it is. Delta v dot rehab. Uh, that's the website. Or you can just give us a call and they, they'll order one for you. Okay. So, but it's delta v dot rehab if you want a delta v. Anyways, delta v's are used for respiratory muscle training and bronchial hygiene, hyperinflation therapy. Um, it works on a lot of different things, though. But uh, this is how we get. We use this device. We don't use breathers or anything like that because uh, they don't have any uh, NIF uh, manometer. For instance, let me show you this real quick. You see, I should have one uh, NIF. It's an NIF. Let me see if I have one in here. I should have one. Can you can you guys give me one hot second? I just want to see. It, uh, Okay, so this is a NIF manometer. I'm not asking you guys to get this. <laughs> I'm just going to show. I'm just going to show you. So a NIF 
Nephometer. I'm going to open this up for any packaging. So this measures how much force I have in my lungs to breathe in and out. So there's my gauge. So the orange marker just sets, just basically puts me where my, uh, where my inhalation pressure is. So if I breathe in through it, where am I at? In the green zone, right? Okay. So that shows me how much pressure. Okay. Now, if I attach a delta V to it, just like so, I breathe in and out through it. Sorry. I'm going to set this back so you can see, so I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you or anything. So I'm going to put this back to zero. Okay, that's the marker. Put it back to zero. Now I'm going to breathe in through this through a, let's say, I'm not even going to put it up to a seven. I'm just going to put it up to a six. Okay, right now that's at a six. That's a seven. I know it's hard to see on here, but I can see it. Anyways, I'm going to breathe in through it. Okay, so pressure is roughly, oh, let me show you. It went really high, but it's just so you can see it. Can you see that? So I'm going to try to do it so you can see it. So it's way past the green, which is a lot of pressure. Okay, it's way past the green, which is a lot of pressure. Now, watch this. If I take this off and we replace it with this device, what a lot of people will think is the best. Let me show you why it's not. Attach it. I'm going to put the pressure to its highest. Inhale six, exhale five. I'm going to breathe in through it. Set this back to ground zero again. Okay, back to zero again. I'm going to breathe in through it. Okay. How high did the pressure go? Not very high. At its highest setting. Why is this not as good as this one, as the Delta V? Well, first off, the Delta V, you can attach it to an incentive spirometer to measure flow rate systems. So if I attach it to an incentive spirometer, let's say I have this at a seven, okay? And let's say I didn't know how to do respiratory muscle training. So I was breathing in. Because I can't bring that flow meter, flow meter zones for respiratory muscle training should be here to there. Okay, anything? Your phone. My phone? Um, I don't think I have my phone. I think, yeah. It's not the one on the, uh, on the nightstand. It's, I believe it's on the desk. Okay. Because I can't lift that on a seven, I can't lift that flow meter. I'm trying to bring it halfway or higher, but I can't. That means the setting is too high. I can't measure my flow rate with this. So I don't know if this setting is too high or not. When I do breathe in at its highest setting, five, over six, I can hear air come in and out on a delta V because remember, how do we, this is like, this is a respiratory muscle training, RMT, right? It doesn't really have a weight, so how does it make resistance? By decreasing the diameter, right? As you decrease the diameter, it takes more pressure to push through a small diameter. Now you have to understand at what flow rate Meaning, how fast should I be breathing in for this to be correct? You don't know on this one because there's no way to manage your flow rate. A delta V, you can manage your flow rate because you can attach it to an incentive spirometer, meaning you're always doing it correctly. If you're within the correct parameters, meaning when you breathe in through a delta V and you keep the flow meter halfway to high, you're always, the weight setting is correct for you, okay? If you set this to a five and six, and it's really tough for you, but you're not sure if you're at the right flow rate, you're guessing the whole time. Delta Vs, you're never guessing. That's why clinicians, especially for virtual pulmonary and cardiac rehab, we use Delta Vs. We don't use breathers, okay? That's why we don't use, we used to use breathers. We, we don't use them anymore. 
Uh, well, for a long time, we haven't used them for a long time. Okay, so that's the reason why we don't use breathers anymore. Uh, Delta Bs are the top elite ones. Let's do a question. I think you missed it. Let me see, Michelle. Hold on a second. Let me look up some questions here from Michelle. Uh, doo -doo 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 Michelle. Okay. I'm an HRN and I am a smoker trying to quit. Have cut back a lot. Haven't been able to quit. Uh, will it take longer to rehabilitate any suggestions? Okay. So if you're... It won't take long to rehabilitate somebody who is a constant smoker. Okay, uh, you're going to be in uh, since you're in the program. They're going to work with you with uh, smoking titration and uh, how to come off cigarettes altogether. Um, the one thing is, is that what is the percentage of, and this is what American Lung Association also stated, what is the percentage of people that got COPD from smoking? A lot of people think it's a very high number. It's actually only 13%. So whether you like it or not, whether you've been told in the past um, that, oh, everyone gets COPD from smoking, that's not true. Okay, COPD only accounts for 13%. We used to think it accounted for all COPD cases, but we found out after studies and peer review and studies and studies that we found out that not everybody who smoked got COPD. Even if they smoked two packs a day for 40 years, they didn't get COPD. Okay. It's all, ba it's so, um, I know it's, it, for those that didn't know, it's a big shock and you're thinking, oh, he's lying. I can't lie. I can't lie in this because it's my license that I'll, that's on Jeopardy. I'm not going to risk my license. Okay, so it's either I know it or I don't. If I don't know it, I'm going to ask somebody else that might know it. But that, obviously, I know. <laughs> so um, it's, COPD is not necessarily always from smoking. It only accounts for 13% of the population. Okay, but yes, it won't take longer to rehabilitate you, uh, but it is best to come off of cigarettes altogether so you can be rehabilitated. But in a way of saying, it might take a little longer if you're still smoking, okay? But not everybody who gets COPD you know, smoked, and not everybody who smoked got COPD. Okay, sometimes it can, it's actually uh, genetic, sometimes. I hope that answered your question. I grew up with wood stove. I think that's part of my COPD. Yes. Uh, growing up with uh, wood stoves, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the smoke inhalation and everything, especially carbon monoxide, uh, can lead to a lot of that. Absolutely. Uh, with exercising on my new lungs, week three, do you use Delta Vs alone or with the spirometer? So the reason why you attach a Delta V to an incentive spirometer is to measure, to see if the setting that you're at, let's say it's a five or a six or a four, is to see if you can do a five or a six or a four or a one or a two or a three, all the way up to seven. It's just measuring. That's all you're doing. You're using an incentive spirometer to measure your flow rate. Okay. So, uh, like, I'm not going to make it confusing for you, but let me do it like this. I have this at a seven. And let's pretend, because I, I did this just before. But let's say I have this at a seven and I can't inhale through it keeping the flow meter at least halfway or higher. Because I can't do that, it only gets to just less than half. Okay, then I know a setting of a seven is too heavy. So now I know not to use a seven. Then I go down to a three. Let's say I go down to a three, I can breathe in. But I can easily bring the flow meter all the way to the top. That means the weight setting on a three is too light. So now I'm going to increase it to, let's say, uh, a five, okay? Okay, because at a five, I can bring it at, at least here. I can't bring it all the way to the top, and it's definitely coming up at least the middle to a little higher than an arrow. Then I know a five is the correct setting for me. And at that point, I can take it off the incentive spirometer and just use it freestyle, meaning I don't need to use my incentive spirometer for that. So a, five, a setting of five is proper for me. Now, a setting for five for some people might be tough, right? So you use the incentive spirometer to see what's, what setting you should be at, and then at that point, you can do a freestyle. That's the reason for attaching to an incentive spirometer. The other reason to attach to an incentive spirometer, you don't have to replace the mouthpiece, meaning you have that other mouthpiece that came with the incentive spirometer, you replace it with a delta V. All you have to do is set the delta V to a zero. You're very welcome. Set a delta V to a zero. 
and it has there's no set and there's no weight to it because it's zero it's at a zero there's no weight so by definition you can easily measure you know you can't measure with resistance according to uh, uh american chest physician guidelines so you won't always want to add a zero when you measure okay you're right yes you are welcome for that all right now weight control weight control so i saw there's a couple comments on this First one is how to compare results of my recent lung function test. Look at the FEV, FEC like I just brought up and I was, I was basically answering this question. Now, oh, that's better. Uh, what can you do once emphysema makes you winded and you can't walk to do normal grocery shopping? What can you do? You, so you do hyperinflation therapy and you do one-to-one -one ratios or two-to-one ratios with walking, meaning one step you take, breathe in, now, at what depth? You breathe in at what depth? You want to breathe in part, you know, you, you want to at least fill up your lungs halfway. So one step inhale, fill up your lungs halfway to get a lot of more air so that 4 to 6% of a large volume can make it into the blood. So you can take one step inhale, one step exhale, and as your pace increases, your respiratory rate will increase. Uh, but that's, these are common breathing techniques to help with walking and breathing at the same time. What I see a lot of people doing is they'll slow their breathing down because they, they heard from Wikipedia or YouTube or something that, you know, I mean, we're on YouTube, but, but I'm actually a licensed clinician, you know. Um, but um, as you're walking, uh, you know, according to the VQ ratio, uh, that's how much, let me bring it up like this. Okay. Okay. So here. All right. Okay, I'll explain this in a second. Let me just draw it up here. Okay. All right. So basically, RPE is the rate of perceived exertion. If I am, uh, so 10 being the worst, to 0 being the least, I don't like to look at it that way, but let's just pretend it's that way. Look at this also as a board scale. Okay. So 10 being the worst out of breath, 0 being the least out of breath. All right. When you're doing fast walking or running, your rate of perceived exertion will be a lot higher. So if that is seven, okay, if it's around a four, oops, I apologize. I wrote that wrong. I wrote that wrong. It's my fault, my fault, my fault. Don't hear these lines. All right, anyways. Okay, now if my rate of perceived exertion or my board scale is very high, it's either I'm doing fast walking or running, meaning my volume has to be higher. If I'm breathing at five, let's say a thousand, let's say 750 milliliters, this would be about a thousand 
1,500 milliliters. Up here would be around 4,000 milliliters, okay, meaning a full breath. You know, how much air is necessary to keep that body alive? Anyways, if I'm only resting or reading or doing light work, like uh, washing dishes and things like that, my respiratory rate or my volume of how much air should be coming into lungs is very minimal. It's around 750 to 1,000 milliliters, okay? Let's say I want to go for a jog or I want to go for a run, which needs a higher volume, more air coming in, a higher respiratory rate, okay? So the higher the respiratory rate, the higher the activity, right? The severe the activity. All right, so if I'm exercising around a four, five, and a six, my volume should be going around 1,500 milliliters every six to, uh, six to seven seconds, meaning I have to breathe more frequently, right? If I'm walking, inhale, exhale. I don't have to breathe as much, right? But if I'm running, as my pace increases, my respiratory rate increases. According to Bronson's Guide of Cardiac and Pulmonary Rehab, especially for the cardiac rehab, it's called a VQ ratio. The higher the activity level, the higher the volume, meaning more air is needed to supply that body. Okay, it's called the VQ ratio, all right? So if I am only sitting and resting, I don't need a large volume, meaning I can breathe, I don't wanna breathe super shallow, but I wanna breathe uh, you know, a quarter of my breath maybe when I'm sitting down doing nothing. As soon as I start doing activities, my respiratory rate's gonna increase because my heart rate's increasing, meaning lactic acid is being produced, being buffered out into my system, turning into CO2. That's how the body's chemistry works, okay? You're very welcome, Michelle, you're very welcome. So Delta Vs are used six times a day, 10 minutes each. Six times a day, 10 minutes each until your volumes are up to at least 50% of your max. So remember I was putting up 65 milliliters per kilogram. You just have to rewind this video. Uh, 65 milliliters per kilogram, ideal body weight, that's your max. So let's say your max is 5,000 milliliters, which mine was 5,330. If I can get to just above 2,500 or more, good. That means I'm okay with exercising. Now I have another problem because let's say I haven't exercised for a long time. All right, now I can be out of breath because I'm out of shape. Nothing to do with my lungs. Now I have to develop tolerance called exercise endurance. I have to develop tolerance to an exercise now. Because somebody, oh, we get this a lot where somebody's like, Alex, I'm still getting out of breath. I was in your program, I'm still getting winded. And I was like, well, how are you getting winded? What do you mean? Give me an example. He said, and he says, uh, and this has happened a couple times where somebody's, uh, somebody's like, well, I walked five miles and I'm just, I get winded just like I was in the beginning. I said, when you first started, you were out of breath at five feet. Now you're out of breath at five miles. Do you understand? And this is me talking to the gentleman, because uh, it happens, you know, where somebody is like, Alex, I still get out of breath. I was like, well, according to clinical research, you have improved dramatically because now you used to get out of breath at five feet. Now you're getting out of breath at five miles. Which who would like that one? Exactly, okay. Being out of breath is not a disease. Now, if you're sitting down resting and you're out of breath, that's different. But if you're exercising, your respiratory rate should be up. You know, you should be a little winded. That's what this is, the RPE, rate of perceived exertion, or you can look at it as a Borg scale. Borg scale is B-O-R-G. The higher the work of breathing, see if I have my flashcards here. Better breathing for, uh, for the Home Rehab Network? Let me show you here. <clears throat> okay, kind of look at it like here's a pain scale. Okay, now if I looked at simply rate your work of breathing when you exercise with 10 being the worst and zero being the least. When you're active, try to stay between a four to a six. You don't want to be too high on your work of breathing, you know, unless you're going for a fast walk or a jogging or running, you know. Uh, note, a work of breathing of six is the maximum you should feel uh, that you should uh, be able to tolerate before stopping. If you feel that your work of breathing is not manageable, then you're probably greater than a six. Make sure to slow down and breathe deeper if possible 
uh, if you're only feeling slight work of breathing, then most likely your Borg scale or your RPE might be uh, from a zero to a three, meaning you're not working hard enough. Basically, it's equivalent to resting. You know, so if you're working out, let's say you're working out and you did a talk test, you're saying more than, you know, uh, more than uh, seven words, you know, you're saying more than, so you can do this. My breathing is manageable, so my breathing, let's just say that I did that, right? So four, five, six, so that was six, sorry. Anyways. Uh, the more words I can say, anything past the six, the less out of breath I am. If I can only say one or two, it gives me hope. Maureen, um, there's no such thing. You, know, you uh, I love, I love that you love this program. I love this is a great program, but um, there's no such thing as hope. See, um, and I, I'm not trying to be a smart butt on this. I, I just want you to understand here. Uh, Good way of uh, easy way of saying this is it's not based off of hope. It's it's either you do it or you don't. You don't rely on hope to get better. You rely on your clinicians to get you better. You know, a lot of people pray for us, and I'm not sure why. But and I understand why. You know, but you know, I'm kind of like a scientist in a sense. I, I do research and calibration. I do all sorts of things. The, the thing is, I, I I I study. Okay, I study. I do research. I test my uh, my hypothesis against a large variation of people uh, with certain techniques and see if those techniques work. And then I will uh, take the, uh, my, the evidence I've gathered uh, to prove the hypothesis and then make it an actual clinical, you know, uh, exercise or technique. Oh. <laughs> I think pulmonary doctor should be required to take your class. I understand. I understand. But, um, you know, uh, in school, I never. Uh, so in school, I had a 4.0 GPA. Um, I loved everything I was doing. I loved it. But but mind you. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of doctors that don't know pulmonary rehab. They, they know about the concept of pulmonary rehab. And a lot of pulmonologists know about the concept of pulmonary rehab, but they don't realize it works so well because we're the only company that shows a higher success rate. All the others show average, and a lot of doctors don't know about the program that gives a 98 percentile uh, good outcomes versus the ones that give a uh, 11 percent successful uh, success, meaning. Um, but Rex, you make me blush, man. Uh, we pray for you because I feel God gave you your talents. God did give me my talents, yes. And um, you know what's funny? You know, you know what's funny? Uh, I know there's some people that know about this. Um, several years ago, I got ran over by a bus, a 20-ton bus. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was at the conference by the sea doing the conference in front of all these clinicians, the directors of pulmonary care and all these respiratory therapists and everything. Um so I like to ride my, uh, my bike, my bicycle, right? I have a motorcycle too, but that's not going to exercise me. So I was riding my bicycle and I got hit by a uh, uh, MTA bus. And uh, mind you, big city bus. It ran over my torso and I even have uh, the, the shirt. My wife kept the shirt because she, she kind of like hangs it up in a sense. Uh, so I don't wear it. And, uh, anyways, so imagine a 20-ton bus ran over my torso. The hospital and the ambulance arrived. Everybody thought I was dead and I was mangled inside the tires. Okay. Once, and there was video on this video, video, the MTA bus had a video camera showing what happened. So the bus ran over me and I got up and I dusted myself off and I wound it up with just two bruises and a scrape. That was it. The ambulance that came over really quickly over in Ocean City um, took me to the hospital, and the hospital people were all ready for is it, the guy still alive is what they responded. And uh, I guess they said, you're not going to believe this. So they brought me in. And they said, where's the guy? He said, that's him. That him? And I'm there sitting up in the, in the gurney, sitting up. It's like, hey, how's it going? Like, nothing happened. So, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, there's somebody up there that's wanting me to stay around for this purpose, I think. And that, that was the, the takeaway from the story.
but anyways, guys, uh, that's uh, that's all the time I have. Uh, I wanted to go over a lot of the other questions, but these were really great questions. I hope I answer a lot of that stuff uh, for you. But uh, uh, remember, doing respiratory muscle training. If you don't have a respiratory muscle trainer, grab three coffee straws. Oh, you remember that? Yeah, that was super crazy because I dusted myself off when I was supposed to have died. And they were expecting my ribs to be punctured out. My lung was out of my body. That's what they were assuming what they were going to see. They didn't expect to see somebody that just had a couple bruises and a couple scrapes. That was it. You know, so I was like, somebody loves me up there. So I figure I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because, yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like the talents that I have um, are, are still needed. And I still have a lot of more saving of people I need to do. That's why I'm very ambitious and also um, – Nothing, I never let anything stop me from getting in my way because I just feel like it's, you know, there's always an excuse for something. <laughs> you know, but anyways, um, I got that brother in some memories. Oh, my God. If you can only see their faces, you know, the cars and everything. It was super crazy. It was super crazy. But, uh, yeah, that actually happened. Ran over by a bus. You know, you know, you know the craziest thing also was the, uh, the lawyer. Uh, they, they uh, I guess this law a lawyer came into the hospital because they were doing a, a checkup on me. But this lawyer came up and um, said, uh, you know, I was talking about suing the MTA bus and all that stuff. And I was like, I was like, uh, I'm not here to do that. And he says, no, but you can get a lot of money. And, uh, and so he was saying, imagine how much money you would get if you died. What's the point of that? I didn't, I didn't understand what this lawyer was doing, but that actually happened. Mel, do you remember that? Come here real quick. He said, Mel, Mel's been with me since the beginning. Hold on, hold on one second, one second, one second, one second. Just real quick, really quick. If you guys need to leave, you can leave. Hold on one second. No, come over here. Come in and view. Remember when I got ran over by the MTA bus? Yeah. Yeah. So I got ran over by the MTA bus, and then the lawyer was like, imagine how much money you would get if you died. And I was like, I'm not here to sue anything. But uh, I said, uh, you know, it was just the most ridiculous thing. But the whole bus and I, the torso, and I think I, it was just like two or three bruises and that was it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but Crazy. I just, oh, anyways, I know Crazy. you're busy. I was. No, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. But, uh, but anyways, uh, guys, that's it. Uh, I'll see you back on Thursday. On Thursday, if we can try to do some of the exercises instead of just education. But if you just want the education, I'm fine with that. You know, I'm uh, I'm very good with you know the education side, but in school, yeah, I study the the whole textbook. It's just uh... <laughs> uh, yes, I am Alex. Um, I am Alex. Alex Grichillen. Um But uh, oh, and uh, Karen says hi. I can't. Well, I guess I can say it. Um, is it okay, Karen, if I see your last name? Hamilton? Oh, yeah, yeah. She says hi. Hello, say hi. She says hi. She's see doing you something. See, all right. All right. Well, guys, that's it. I'll see you back, back uh, on Thursday. Uh, if you're trying to sign up for the program, remember, the program, it's a three-month program, but if you're, if you, if you're very sick or you're, you have a lot of problems that's very severe, uh, and you want to stay in longer, you can do that, but we just have to, you know, uh, we get, just got to let your doctor know. But it's a three-month program. You just have to, it's all, it's covered by insurance. We also take uh, Medicaid uh, um, in Maryland. I know that, uh, Medicaid in Maryland. But uh, anyways, just, uh, yeah, if you sign up, uh, then you'll be seeing me first, and then I'll get you through to a certain level. Once you advance to a higher level, then we move you to uh, even a higher level than that, which is um, like with Melanie's class, they're doing, you know, long distances and uh, she's very fun. She'll do Tai Chi yoga, you know, harmonica therapy and all these other things. So the, she works the very advanced classes, but she all, also works with new, new people too. So um, she's very familiar with all that. So anyways, we have a lot of therapists and uh, we've also are hiring another therapist with uh, extremely high um, a list of alkylates, just a, a, a huge amount of qualifications uh, on there that just are insane. 30 years experience, you know, this new therapist, 
30 years experience that worked nothing but as a director, assistant professor, and all of that stuff. So I think she'll may make a pretty good asset here. Anyways, um, uh, guys, that's it. Uh, look at the number on the comment section from Brittany Shepard. Uh, that is the number to call, and that's it. Guys, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.